Thank you. All right. So, welcome to Inductive Bible Study 601 slash 101. So, we, today we'll be going over the basics of the Inductive Bible Studying Method. And uh, before we start, can I ask Pastor Bill to lead us in an opening prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Father, as we get ready to uh, rightly divide your word of truth. And Father, we just thank you for this time of fellowship, Lord, together in the word. The Lord is praying that you would, by your spirit, do the Lord in your word, and teach us all things, and bring all things to remember us about the word. The Lord just teach us to be better students, how to study the word and God. Father, I thank you for the time that Pastor Joe puts in your screen. Father, I just pray that. He would speak to our hearts, that he would speak to our hearts and to Father, I just thank you for watching in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, inductive Bible study. Right over here. I could find the blueprint. Here it is. <laughs> the word inductive. Okay. There are two words that we could derive from the word inductive, okay? One of the words is to induce. And induce means to move into action, okay? So therefore, move to action. And another word that we can derive from here is to in, induct. And to induct means to, to bring in, to introduce, to put in, put formally in position. Okay, so let's use the word put in position. So, when we do the inductive Bible study, we should be able to achieve these two things in relation to the Bible or the Word of God. Okay? So therefore, if we, uh, if we do the inductive Bible study method, we should put the Word of God into action. Okay? Scripture tells us that we're not supposed to be only hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. So therefore, if we do the inductive Bible study method, then we should move the Word of God into action. Okay? Without action, what happens? No. no. <laughs> Without action means that we are not really uh, giving uh, importance to the Word of God. See? And another thing is that the Word of God, the Bible, should be put in the right position. Where should the Word of God be placed in our, so in our uh, lives? Huh? Where? 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 It should be kept in our hearts. But David said, Thy word have I kept in my heart that I will not then again, you so therefore put it should be put into action and it should be placed in the place where it is supposed to be, which is in our hearts. Okay? There are many ways to study the Word of God, but to me, this has been the most fruitful and most profitable. This is how I grew to where I am now in terms of my faith, in terms of my walk with God, in terms of my spiritual health, see? in terms of my vision, eternally speaking. Okay? Now, how do we treat the Word of God? How should we treat the Word of God? Basing it on Deuteronomy 8.3, it tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out 
of the mouth of God or proceeds from the mouth of God. So what does this verse tell us? Okay. It talks about life. Okay. And in this case, life can be achieved how? By bread, right? But not only bread, but by by that. Clear so far? Okay. We could understand this part that we live with the bread. But before the bread can become useful to us, what do we have to do with it? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you have to <clears throat> eat the word of God. Eat the bread, right? Because that bread would be useful if you don't eat it. You could chew it and then spit it out in the snack. But when you chew it, when you eat it, it means that you ingest it, okay? And that bread becomes part of you and it's broken down so that it will give, you'll get the sustenance from that bread that you are eating. Make sense? Okay? So therefore, if we understand the bread part, now, how can that be when it comes to the Word of God? Okay, I'm going to use an acronym when we talk about word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Can we just say one? Okay. So therefore, if we eat bread so that we can live, okay, then if it comes to the word of God, what should we do with it also? We should also eat it. Right? So therefore now we will add another letter here and we will call it E E Wong. We should learn how to eat the word of God. Okay? But how do we eat the word of God? And so now we come to the scripture that you have on your handouts. Okay? And you want to read that scripture? Dad? Come on! Study to show thyself approved unto God, the work that the workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Write me the mind of the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Okay, so that's what you have here on the handouts. So connecting it with eating the word of God, okay, what is the action that man does here in this scripture? Study. Study and? So therefore, he rightly he rightly divides. Right? Now, rightly dividing the word of God. Okay? When you eat the bread, you put the whole, or just let's take one, uh, one of those rolls over there. Okay? When you get one of those rolls, do you put that whole thing in your mouth? What do you do? You bite? Then after you bite? No? Chew first! Okay? Chew that portion and then up to, up to the point what? Up to the point that it will become swallowable. Swallowable. Correct? Because when it's swallowable, then it could go inside and then like I said, now it can be used for whatever purpose that, that food will be for the body. So in essence, when you're biting it, you are dividing it. Okay? And when you chew it, 
you're dividing it more and more. Because even if you bite, if you don't chew, you try and swallow it, what could happen? <laughs> you could even choke. But our body, God is so good that He makes our body that, okay, it will tell the mouth, okay, chew on it, keep on chewing it, and then it will say, okay, it's ready to swallow, then you swallow. Right? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> okay, so therefore, chewing, biting, chewing is part of rightly dividing that bread. Okay? So likewise, in the inductive Bible study method, we are, we learn how to rightly divide the Word of God, breaking it down to the point that that, the Word of God, will, like the bread, will find passage into where? Our hearts. Okay? Bread goes to the body, physical body. The Word of God goes to the heart. So this gives us uh, another idea that how many lives do you have? How many kinds of lives do you have? Lives. How many kinds of lives? Kinds. Yeah. Two. You have the bread, which is for the physical life. Then you have the Word of God, which is for the spiritual life. Okay? So we have actually two types of lives. And we should be aware of that. We show, and so we ask ourselves, how much attention do we give to the physical life? How much attention do you give to the physical life? A lot, a lot right? No, the, so the question that you ask here, how much attention do you give, do you give to the spiritual life? Okay. Not enough. And so therefore, if we value the physical life, then we give the right attention to it. Likewise, if we value the spiritual life, we should give attention to it. Next question is, which is more important to you? Oh, the spiritual life. Yeah, that would be the right answer. But then, uh, are our actions uh, really supporting that statement that, yes, spiritual life is more important than the physical what life? What makes spiritual life more important? Okay, very good question. What makes uh, spiritual life more important? Okay. Physical can break down. Okay, physical can break down. It's, it's eternal. Okay, spiritual life is really our should be our eventual destination after this life. Scripture tells us that we are. This is not our. This land, this earth, is not our home. We're just. Visitors, we're just pilgrims. We're just passing through. See? And so God, as he has he say, as told us in John 3.16, right? Which is one of the verses that we studied inductively. John 3.16 says what? Tan. No, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay? So therefore, God loves us. He gives us His only Son, Jesus Christ. For what purpose? For what, for what, for what purpose did uh, Jesus, uh, God give His only begotten Son? Yeah. <coughs> What are we supposed to do with Jesus Christ? Ah, believe in what does believe in me? Uh, come on, <laughs> touch down, Christian, rejoice. <coughs> to believe, so who, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, to the end that all believe that believe in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. If we want to have everlasting life and not perish, we need to believe in Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that God requires of us to believe in Jesus. To trust Him. What's next? To delight in Him. 
to make a commitment to him and to rest in Jesus Christ. That's why he said, touchdown, Christian, rejoice. The men's Bible study uh, board, it talks about goal. What is our goal? What is your ultimate goal in life? Do God's will. Huh? Do God's will for what purpose? The ultimate. For, my, for myself or to serve his purpose on this earth? Yeah. The ultimate. What's your ultimate goal? That I go to heaven. Yeah, and, yeah, couldn't they? That I and go to heaven and be with him forever. Yeah. And rule and reign with him, right? In our what? What kind of bodies do you think we'll be having? Glorified. Glorified bodies. And if you want to know more about what to expect when you will be in heaven, read about the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, and look for the verse, To him who overcomes, then read what comes next. That is what, what the things that we will be doing in heaven. Aside from giving praise and glory, worthy are you, right? Singing with 24 elders, and everybody that's there will be glo uh, giving glory to God, praising and worshiping Him. Yeah. Amen. We will be, in, that's why, aside from the bread, okay, one of the things that we'll be doing in heaven is eating of that which God forbode to Adam and Eve. Now he will allow us to eat from that same tree. Do you know that? Yep. <laughs> Go back to, uh, like I said, the, the seven churches. And I just, to him that overcometh, I will give the privilege to... Then you could say, oh, so that's what, that's what I'll be doing in heaven. See? All that comes by, by the grace of God, I learn all of that as I continue to use inductive Bible study method. See? I've been, by the grace of God, there's a group in Long Beach that we've been doing uh, the inductive Bible study method for over 20 years already. 27 to be exact. They're the ones keeping count, but I, I don't keep count, but we've been doing it for 27 years. And God has been faithful to always be there and feed the people that are there that makes them come and hunger and thirst for some more. 27 years. If I were doing that on my own, <laughs> what, what, what do you think is going to happen? I would have been burned out a long time ago. But it is God's work. Okay? The people go there and they get fed. They get fed. Fed by who? Not by me, but by God through the Holy Spirit. And what type of study were we doing? What type of study were we using? Inductive Bible study. I grew from the first time that I came here. I grew up healthily, maturedly, because I was blessed that the Lord provided a pastor teacher. Not only was he a pastor, but he was also a teacher. And every time there was a study, boy, I was fed because I ate. I was able to eat the Word of God because the pastor just divided, rightly dividing the Word of God to the point that I was able to ingest it. Everyone agrees, right? What you are is what you 
eat. Eat a lot, eat a lot of hamburgers every day. What's going to happen? You will look like a hamburger. <laughs> okay? We are what we eat. And believe me, the best food that we could, uh, we should aim for is to be able to eat the Word of God and feast on the Word of God. That's why one of the Beatitudes, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. How is your hunger? How is your appetite towards the word of God? When we use the inductive Bible study, it will increase your appetite. It should increase your appetite. And then you'll want to keep wanting more and more. Okay. And the effect of the word of God in us is what? What is the effect? When you are fed, what is your uh, reaction? You'd be full and you would be satisfied and you know what comes out of your mouth? Thankfulness? And what is your attitude to the person that uh, fed you? Gratitude. Gratitude. You would love that person, right? Correct? If somebody feeds you, what is your attitude? What should be your attitude towards that person? Especially if the food was good. You said, thank you, and you would appreciate that person, should love that person, right? <clears throat> Likewise, how can we show our love to God? See? He who loves me is he who, who has one who has my word and who puts it into action. John chapter 14, somewhere in there. Okay? So, how do we do inductive Bible study? Any questions so far about inductive Bible study? Okay. So, how does inductive Bible study differ from the other types of studies? Because there are different ways of studying the Bible. We have one what we call deductive, wherein it starts with a premise or a thought. Okay, and then from that thought, you could develop a devotion or a study. Okay? Another way of teaching the Bible is sharing on opinions, which I do not uh, really uh, push, because sharing opinions is what? Subjective, what else? You are using the opinions of other people. This is when people go to commentaries and they base their study on the commentaries. Okay? Inductive Bible study, on the other hand, you just go to the Word of God. You just go to the Bible. Okay? And you just, when you go to the Bible, then you just depend on the you depend on the Holy Spirit. You go there. Lord, I don't know what you have for me today, but I am here and I want to eat your word. Now that we understand what eat means. Okay. And if we have that kind of heart towards uh, His Word, what will He do? He will give us the desires of our heart. So one thing about the inductive Bible study is, first and foremost, led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? And since, since it is a study, okay, in order that it, it is a study, there has to be what? There has to be a teacher. Okay? And if, that per, if God is the teacher, what should be our role then? If he is the 
teacher. Then we should be the <coughs> student. See? Do we see ourselves as that when we approach the Word of God? If we are not a student, then we will never be able to mature, grow in our relationship with God. Okay? Therefore, it is led by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, inductive Bible study is organized and it is systematic. Okay? When we study the Word of God, it should be organized and it, there should be a system. Why? Because God is a God of order. And we know that if there is order, then blessings from Him will come forth. And one way of being organized is to study the Word of God book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by When we do the inductive Bible study, we do it organizedly and systematically by going book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. What does this mean? It means that if we have a book, we start on chapter 1, verse 1, all the way to the last chapter, last verse. Okay, And we don't skip. It should be continuous. What is the purpose there? Okay, so therefore we are going to get very good. Thank you. If we want to receive whole counsel, if we want to receive the whole counsel of God, then we need to study it this way. Which would you rather have? A partial counsel of God? Or would you rather have the full counsel of God? Well, I don't know if it happens here in the United States, but in the Philippines it often is a lot that somebody sends you a text and then you would receive it and then it says some text missing. So you don't really want to know what the message is. Does that happen here in the United States? No, but in the Philippines it happens a lot. Somebody sends me a message and it says, I'm reading part of it, then there here comes some text missing. You don't get the full message. But if we want to get the full message of God, study it this way, this method. Not only that, but it also ties in with this. Verse. Do you see a connection of inductive Bible study towards this verse? That we are going this, this, this? How does it tie into this? You got the order. No? Not many people study the Word of God, every single word. But believe me, there are times when I am doing, I'm studying the Word of God and the Word of uh, God will say, hey, focus on this word, one word. Okay? And I, if I, uh, uh, when I listen to that, then I will just stick to that one word and I will 
put all my time to study on that single word. And guess what? Following study, oh, the Lord wanted me to talk about that because somebody in the, in the group <laughs> needed to understand what was that. Okay? I'll give you a challenge, every one of you. When you, uh, when the Bible tells us, when God says, the glory, His glory, what does that mean? What is God's glory to you? What can God's glory do to you? What is the glory of God? Something to think about. Very interesting. I made uh, the Lord led me to that uh, word one night and I used to study it. Bible dictionaries, the word of God itself. And I was blessed. So hopefully... The Lord will say, okay, you could use that study that you have there, here. And I will be, you can use it. So, a quick question really quick, Joe. You um, had talked about commentaries earlier and how um, with that specific other method, you know, like, you know. Deductive? You know, like deductive yeah. Does, do commentaries have a role in inductive Bible study in part of the process? Sorry. Uh, commentaries are the opinions of other people with regards to the Word of God, right? right. And usually, commentaries are their opinions which God gave to them for their own purpose, for their own congregation, if you or for their own study at that time. Right. Now, when you do your inductive Bible study, it might agree with their uh, opinion, or it might be a little bit not up. For me, I only go to the commentaries when I have done my study myself, inductively. Then if it, uh, if it confirms, then, oh, this guy, we have the same thought, so therefore it's sort of a confirmation. But to me, commentaries are just there, I don't know, I would call it uh, fast food. Okay? So when you're preparing for a Bible study, you would do this portion and come up with your findings, and then maybe you would read some commentaries also, but not, not like you, it wouldn't be part of this study in preparing for a Bible study. I wouldn't even read the commentaries. If you really have prepared you between you and God alone, and God has given you already, you then more for personal study, you would, you know, not only read a commentary, not even uh, you were personally studying Second uh, Corinthians, the whole book, and personal, you know, so you, you do your inductive Bible study. But well, let's say you, you know one day you couldn't sit down. And, Dig into a good meal. You're saying that commentaries would be kind of eating on the run. Yeah, that's why I call uh, fast food. <clears throat> you want to learn, uh, get ready for uh, that? Yes, go to the commentary. Inductive Bible study is one thing that is uh, it will require some time, some effort from your part, and if we have Foods that we eat, there are different kinds of food. What's the best food that you can eat? Okay. Okay, your barbecue. Why is your barbecue good? No, why? 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 Yeah. Because love and what? Time and effort. That's why it turns out Good. See? Home cooked food compared to fast food, which would you rather have? Home cooked. Home cooked takes what? Time. Love. See? 
inductive Bible study is that way also. It takes time. It takes love for God. See? And when you do it that way, then the food will be much, much more fulfilling than what you would get from commentaries. Just like home cooked food is more healthy compared to fast food. Fast foods, they don't care about your health. But home cooked food, oh, they care about who's going to eat it, that it will be healthy for them. Okay? Okay, any questions so far? We're supposed to rightly divide the Word of God. Chapter by chapter, verse by verse, uh, chap uh, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Okay? Another uh, scripture to keep in mind when we're doing the inductive Bible study, 2 Timothy 3.16. You want to read that, somebody? It's not there, uh, Todd, so... Second Timothy three sixteen. You know, if you have a chance, one of these days, study, make a, uh, a study, and do all the three sixteen, the chapter three, verse sixteen verses in the Bible. You'd be surprised what uh, so many. Okay, because we know John three sixteen is good. Second Timothy three sixteen is good. It's all coincidence. <laughs> but it's a good. Okay. Second Timothy three sixteen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Everything else? Yes, please. That the man of God may be complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. Okay. What version is that? Uh, that is New King James. Is that King James? New King James. Ah, New King James. Anybody is a King James? Yeah. I want King James. <laughs> All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and to all good works. Say it to the Lord. Okay, very good. So all in Scripture, all Scripture is inspired by God. Correct? So therefore, the words that are in your Bible, right? Where did this come from? Ah, God. Okay. How did it get written in the how did it become a Bible? Okay, by man putting it together, putting black ink on white paper, and then now man has the ability to read. Or more importantly, not only read but study the word of God. Okay. Where were we? Okay, so Second Timothy three sixteen. If we look at this word, that the word of God is supposed to be profitable. What does it mean, profitable? What's another word that's used in your Bibles for the word profitable? Other uh, uh, versions of the Bible say it is. Useful, okay? And then it tells you it's useful for doctrine, for instruction, for teaching, for admonition, okay? And it has a purpose. What is the purpose of the God's Word? Of God's Word? So that we will be, man will be thoroughly equipped to do good works, but 
Something else aside from that? So that we will be? <coughs> That's why I like the King James because it uses the word perfect. Is it important to be perfect? Is it important to be perfect? What is another word to be perfect? Sure. Okay, what else? Holy. Holy, very good. What is another word that we could use for perfect? Holy. Okay, close. <clears throat> Therefore, from this, it can make man holy and righteous. <clears throat> that other word, that word also means to be the perfect tool for the perfect job at the right time. Amen. Very good. Okay. That word actually so. Okay. Good. But just from what this says, the Word of God should make us this, okay? And is this important? Yes. Why? Okay, does it tie in with uh, the scripture? What? Yep. <clears throat> In order for us not to perish, but have everlasting life, we need to be achieve this and this. Okay? You might want to go back and further break down what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be righteous? Okay? What does it mean to be perfect? Okay? The sacrifices that the people bring to God in the Old Testament, the animals, right? Did you describe them? Anybody? Without spot or blemish. Okay. Will this give us an idea of what this, this means? What can make us spotted or blemish? Oh, therefore, <coughs> Sin. <laughs> so therefore, you might want to go back and spell uh, and uh, review again. What does sin do? See? What does sin do? Separation from God. Death. Death. Okay. Which is an opposite of this. One talks about life, one talks about death. Which one do you want to achieve? Which one do you want to gain? Life. Ah, we want life. So what do we have to do? Believe. Believe. Make, make the word of God Profitable or useful. Make sense? It is there for this purpose, but it has to be profitable and useful to us. Okay? We have some food here. Is that useful to you? 
Well, how, what do you have to do so that it will become useful to you? Ah, so it goes back to eating, eating that. If we don't go there, pick up the food, put it in our mouth, bite it, chew it, swallow it, that is not going to be useful. Correct? Likewise, with the Word of God, if it's just there, but we don't go to it, okay, put our time into it and effort into it, okay, then it will not be profitable, it will not be useful for us. God has given it already. It's our responsibility to make it useful. That it should become useful and profitable to us. Like I said, it's already there, but you have to you have to go to that to that to the food, get it, okay, and eat it. That's why I always talk about being fed by the word of God. See what uh, what is the purpose of pastors? To feed and protect. Who was the first pastor of the Bible? Uh, who was the first pastor? Who was the first pastor? Yes, he's the good shepherd. Then, who do you think was the next pastor that he appointed? Uh, Jesus, the New Testament. Peter. Peter. What did he tell Peter? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Feed. I didn't know you were talking about the New Testament. I was going back to the Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, so therefore, again, very important that as a pastor, okay, we should feed the plant of God. If you're not a pastor, but if you're a person handling the Word of God, make sure that the Word of God will be eaten by the people that you are giving the Word of God to. Okay? Because like I said, once it is, once they can eat it, what can you expect? Yes, once they eat it, what can you expect? When you eat the Word of God, what can you expect? Growth. That's why Paul talks about the milk of the Word versus the meat of the Word. Okay? Which brings us back to Inductive Bible study. It, inductive Bible study is also eating the meat of the word versus the milk of the word. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, I think it talks about, let us therefore go on to perfection not laying again the foundations of let's go to that verse <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 6 and I'll just read <clears throat> therefore Leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto what? Perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, verse 2, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Okay? When we become a believer, 
we should be well versed with all that is stated in verses 1 and 2. Correct? That it says that that is the principle that it is what? Those principles that are stated there, what are they? They are? Let me read it again. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the? Foundation. So these are foundations. Okay? These are the first things that we learn as a new believer. But then we should move on from that. How can we learn more? By going to the inductive Bible study and eating the meat. In another word for inductive Bible study is an in-depth study of the Word of God. You dig in deeper. And that can happen by really breaking it down. So that we can eat it. Break it, break it, break it, break it down to the basics. See? I've uh, given you a lot of challenges. Glory? What is it, glory of God? It's a nice study. Go back and try and study it. Interesting. Okay? So any questions so far about the inductive Bible study method before we go to the how-to part of inductive Bible study? Any questions so far? Todd? Dan? Daniel? Bill? Say, yeah. Um, when we're babies, milk is good. Yeah. And then, but just like the scripture, uh, chapter 6, that perfection is also the word maturity. So when you're a baby, you require milk. That's what he's talking about, the basic agreement. You know, baptism is that way down the cross. But then he's talking about the wounds of meat for maturity. Yeah, talking about you, right? Okay, thank you. Paulette, do you have any questions so far? Yeah. Great. No questions? So everything is nice and clear? So far? Okay. So... Now that we know what inductive Bible study is, let us go to the how to do inductive Bible study. Okay? And there are three simple steps to the inductive Bible study method. Okay? And if you look at your handouts, here, the first step is what? No, it is called. <laughs> observation. That's why, okay? Yeah, reading the text several times is part of observation. If you look at your handouts, the first uh, bullet on that observation page is what? It says, read the text several times. You got, you got already? Okay, yeah. Sound familiar? <laughs> but what does it mean to read the text several times? Okay. <coughs> the more that we read the text, okay, the more that the Lord will impress upon us what He's trying to tell us in that particular text. Sometimes what it means is that King James is hard English, right? Old English, difficult to understand. And sometimes I have that challenge because I'm a King James person. So what I do, as I'm led by the Word of God, that I go to another Bible translation. I could go to the NIV, to the Living Bible, or whatever, and see what that same text or that same verse, how is it translated in the 
other translations. I always tell people that I'm a King James person because to me, the King James still remains as the very specific and it is sharp. Truly sharp compared to the other translations. Okay? An example of that is which one was this one is King James, right? And this is NIV? Yeah. Are you King James? Huh? And the other words in the Bible wherein it talks about it will show you that King James is sharper, more specific than uh, other Bible versions. If you, if you look at uh, 2 Timothy 2.15, okay, in other translation it talks about be diligent, right? Versus King James it says study. So be diligent versus study which one is more precise. See? It gives you a specific action that you're supposed to take, King James. And so that's why I, uh, I, was in, I, was, I grew up in the King James. I stick to the King James. Because that is what the Lord has told me that, hey. Okay. Plus, the King James is the one that is closest to the original. Remember the thing that Mikey gave us in the, in the study? about the, how the Bible came to be, the different kinds of Bibles. The King James is the closest to the original. Okay, so read the text several times. Sometimes the Word of God is difficult to understand on the first reading. But if you read and reread and reread, the Lord will just open that scripture to you. And I've had many instances wherein the Lord has opened scriptures to me, and lately the Lord has been opening scripture to me like Second Corinthians four six. If you have a chance, read that. You want to read that, Greg? Sure. For God who commanded that the light shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the faith of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? On first reading. Does it, does it make sense? There's a lot of things to consider there. But you know, when I, my first reaction, I first read that also was, hmm, does it make sense to me? So I read it, I reread it again. I started from uh, the first verse going all the way to that verse and then still didn't make sense. I was reading the text, in essence, several times. I reread it, and I couldn't get it. And so, I'd stop, then I would meditate on that particular verse. And is it, are we supposed to meditate on the Word of God? Yeah. So you want to know what it means. Does God know that? Yeah. Depending on your sincerity of wanting to hear from God, wanting to learn that particular verse, what, what are you trying to tell me in this verse? Really? What are you trying to tell everyone? See? And I thank God that He always comes through. But it took time. Like I said, I had to read the text several times. Okay, another uh, definition of observation is that you are to record first impressions. How many of you have their Bibles marked or highlighted or what? Is your uh, Bible? Yeah. yeah, where did you underline or mark those? Uh, words or verses. Why? Oh, why? So that I come across it again. 
And why do you why did you underline it? Why do you why do you highlight your Bible? Um, one, I, I want to be able to know what the Lord spoke to me at that time. At that time, in other words, and, you know, important important areas of the Bible. Okay. Why do you mark your Bible? Hold it. Okay, to highlight a particular verse. You mark it, you don't mark your Bible because you're electronic, right? No, I do. You do? I my new Bible. Okay, good. Well, why do you mark your Bible? <coughs> yeah. Okay, um, I read my Bible because there's things that I want. Not only am I marking my Bible, but I'm reading those of things that God revealed to me. Okay, but therefore there, there were some that God impressed on you to mark it. In other words, God is saying, hey, mark this. This is something important. See? So when we're doing the inductive Bible study, after reading the text several times, then there are words or phrases that God will impress upon us. Okay? The letters will just sort of jump and say, okay, God is saying, hey. And when that happens, you're supposed to have your pencil and paper. Just write that impression down under the observations that you have. Okay? And to me, that is the very, that's the first step of the inductive Bible study. That God will speak to you and impress you and say, hey, chew on this. Chew on this. See? Just like the Lord impressed me, chew on the word drawing. So I chewed, I chewed on the word, that word. But it was an impression that God gives to you, probably not for your own purpose, but it might be for the purpose of you delivering the word to, of God to other people. That because if you can deliver the word to other people that the word of God will find root in their hearts, then that means that you are indeed a what? A pastor? An instrument that God is using? Approved by God? And now you are effective Okay? Furnished to do good works, as what we find in 2 3, 16. So, read the text several times. Record first impressions. These first impressions, they might not mean anything on the first part, but then if you obey God and said, and uh, ask God to chew on this, okay? Then, Chew on that word or phrase. Make a study of that particular word or phrase as it uh, relates to the text that you are studying. See? But it is very important that God will impress to you, hey, this is what I want you to chew on. When we do the inductive Bible study, we're not supposed to go there with our own agenda already. We're supposed to be open to what God wants to give us at that time. See? We don't go there and have our own thoughts that they, oh, this is about like this and so I'll, uh, I don't even have to read it. I don't even have to read it. Do you know that in the study of the, uh, the parables that the Lord will give you on one angle of the parable at one time then if you do the same study again He'll give you another angle of that same parable, which you never saw it for. And there are different angles that you could, that the Lord will tell you so that he can really equip you. See, so that you can uh, be fully equipped. Okay? Observation. It says, record who, what, when, where, and how. So that is our observation part. In other words, when we observe, we are merely looking at what does the text 
say? Okay. What does the text say? The second step in the inductive Bible study method is what we call, which is the next page of your, and the highlighted black part is interpretation. <laughs> and in the observation, what does the text say? In the interpretation, it tells tell, it asks the question, what does the text? What does the text what? Mean. mean. Now, if we are to interpret properly, we have some bullet points again in this page. To interpret, it says, interpret literally. Okay? When it says uh, lamb, it means lamb. Okay? When it says uh, study, then it is study. See? When it says repent, then it is repent. Okay? Literally. Okay? Another, word, another way to interpret properly is to study in context. Let us take this verse. Man shall not live my bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we know that that is found in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3. Okay? In order that we can uh, be able to, that God can shed more light into this verse, we have to study it in Context. In other words, how come God inspired this verse in the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy in verse 3? Okay. What was the context then? What was happening during that time? Okay. So therefore, we record, okay, who was talking here in Deuteronomy? Sorry. It, Moses was the person who was talking here, right? And who was he talking to? Israelites, right? And he was talking about what? If you read the, pre the, uh, the verses previous to this, Moses was talking about God, and he was also talking about yeah. Very good. He was talking about manna. What is it? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> huh? 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 And so therefore, you know that Moses, okay, before he could tell the people anything, he had to make sure that, what? No, that he had to go to God, and then he would ask God, what, I, what do you want me to tell to these people? Okay? And so therefore, Moses told the nation of Israel, now that they are liberated, right? They have come from, they've, they've been taken out of bondage, right? Okay. They are now wandering in the, where are they? Wilderness? Yeah, okay. And Moses tells them, okay, God has given you these laws, okay, 
whereby you are supposed to live. Okay? And we know all those, how many laws? 166? Many laws. If you look at the first five books of the Bible, it deals with this law, this law, this law, and this law. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. After Deuteronomy, talks about the different laws that God wants to give to the nation of Israel so that they will be, they will remain as the apple of his eye. Okay, that's the way that they will, they should live. That they're, that's the way that they're supposed to uh, live and survive. Okay, but then Moses, in addition to that, not only are they going to live by this thing, by the bread, the manna, but then they should also live by the word of God. See? Because God tells Moses, Moses tells the people, that says the Lord. This is what God wants us to do. See? And if we, yes, we have the manna, then we will live and Furthermore, if we do the word of God, then we will also live. So, fast forwarding a little bit. Did the nation of Israel do what God wanted them to do? Did they obey God's commandment? Sad to say, they did not. See? That's why they are in the situation that they are in right now as a nation, right? Where are they now? Where's the nation of Israel now? Very small. No? Where? Yeah. They're still scattered. Yeah. But has God forsaken them? No. God is still faithful to them. So, study on in context. Okay? In Deuteronomy, Paul, uh, Moses was reminding the nation of Israel, hey, bread is important, but what is more important? The Word of God. See? Now we know what it means that, what do we have to do with the Word of God? As the people ate the bread, now we should eat the Word of God. How can we eat the Word of God? Rightly divide the Word of God. How can we rightly divide the Word of God? Start with observing. What does the text say? Next, interpret the text. Study in context. Okay? Let Scripture interpret Scripture. It's the next bullet point for interpretation. Okay? The Bible is all the verses in the Bible support each other. You will never find the Bible contradicting one over the other. Why is that so? Why do you say, uh-huh, Paulette? <laughs> I said that the Bible never contradicts. You will never find a contradiction in the Bible. Why? Well, like the uh, uh, scriptures support each other because it is the word of God. Okay? And oftentimes, to be able to explain uh, a word or a uh, happening in the Bible, try and stay in the Bible. Okay, it's better to uh, uh, to stay in the Bible than that way. People cannot uh, argue with you and say, "But that's what did you get that?" See, but if you try and stay in the Bible, they will ask, "What did you get that?" Hey, it's written here. See, just like uh, the brazen serpent, right? Everybody knows uh, the story of the brazen serpent? What is the story of the brazen serpent? Well, Israel, um, 
the hospital. Yes. They had asked us to help them with some sort of work. The brazen serpent, and when they looked at the brazen serpent, they would not die. Yeah, everybody knows that story, right? <coughs> now, yep. But if you look at the lapel pins of the doctors, yeah. you'd find the serpent with on the staff. Okay, they're supposed to preserve life. Now, how do we interpret that? Is that any? How can we make it? How can we make that? Useful to us. Go ahead. John three fourteen says that Moses lifted up the brass serpent and the woman. So Moses son of man be lifted up. And Israel was losing one out there. Okay. So it ties in with this brazen serpent is now stated, which is in the Old Testament. Numbers 21. And you go to the New Testament and it talks about the same brazen serpent that Moses raised. And now the author is saying what? That as the brazen serpent was raised, so must the Son of Man be lifted. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus. Why do you say it's Jesus? That's one of the titles that's given to Jesus. What are the other titles that are given to Jesus just staying in the just staying in the gospel? Matthew, he is the No 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 okay. Start with Matthew. He is the How is Jesus presented in Matthew? How is Jesus presented in Matthew? He is presented as the King. That's why Matthew starts with the genealogy that tells him that he comes from a tribe of Judah and out of Judah the scepter will never leave Judah. Judah is the line of kings just like Levi is the line of priests. So Jesus is presented as the king. In Mark he's presented as the servant. Okay. That's why there you will find the word immediately, immediately, immediately is a word. And then in Luke, he's presented as the son of man. And in John, he's presented as the son of God. Fast forward a little bit. What are the four animals that are in front of God in heaven? <laughs> it ties in with that that one is an ox no no one is the lion no one is the now going with the, the same uh, as a king and then as a servant which is the ox then as a son of man which is the face of man and then the other one is the eagle okay. How did we, how did the Lord uh, put that into what I know? In the word. It's all in the Word. See? How did I get to that? Oh, thank God that this is the uh, a method that I use, that the Lord gave me to use. It's Scripture interpreting Scripture. When you stay in the Bible, you're on safe ground. 
nobody can argue with say with, and say, hey, it's in the Bible. But if you say, I got it from this commentary, see, which one is more stable? Something that you got out of the commentary or something that you got from the Word of God itself? Which would you rather stand on? The Word of God or somebody else's opinion? Word of God. So let interpret, uh, Scripture interpret Scripture. And as you continue to study inductively, Scriptures will just come... The Holy Spirit will just tell you this is Scripture to explain that. Just like what we use for the brazen serpent and Jesus Christ. This is a Scripture that will help you explain this. When you study the word glory... What are some of the scriptures that you would find that the Lord will give you? Okay? Be in the Bible. Okay? And then it, uh, the last bullet point is that New Testament takes precedence. Okay? Aren't you glad that you don't have to go to the temple and bring your lamb or your whatever offering that you have to bring to God for an atonement of sins? Yeah, you don't have to seek where's the high priest, right? Because that is the Old Testament. In the New Testament, what do we learn? Not only is he our high priest, but he is also he is the perfect sacrifice. John the Baptist said when he saw him, "Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world." So, New Testament practices take precedence over the Old Testament, okay? But it's still the same God in the Old Testament, starting with Genesis, the same God in New Testament, the same God in the... So, from Genesis to Revelation, it is the... Same God, right? So New Testament takes precedence. Okay. The last step in the inductive Bible study method is the application. Huh? Application. And the application, to me, is the most important step in the whole process. Okay? And it says, how should I, what's the next word? Respond. Now that you know what the Word of God says, now that you know what it means, your next step, therefore, is to respond to it. See? Now, it ties in also with what I told you earlier, that man should not only be hearers of the Word, but doers of the word. God is so loving that he gives us his word, okay, and he gives us his, a, the chance to obey it or disobey it. If we obey it, is there any good? If we disobey it, is, there, is it good? Okay. I'm doing my devotion in Deuteronomy that it talks about if you hear God talking to the nation of Israel, if you heed my words and obey them, you will be blessed. But if you don't heed my words and disobey them, you will be cursed. Which one you prefer? You want to be blessed or cursed? See? If I ask you that, what is your answer? 
blessed. So what do you have to do so that you will be blessed according to what we just talked about? Then you have to hear the word of God and be obedient to it. See how the application part comes from? It is a question that you ask the other person or the people that you're teaching wherein they have to respond not to you, but they have to respond to God. Okay? <coughs> How can we be obedient to God? What is the first thing that we have to do? Which uh, Pastor Steve covered in the book of Hebrews. <coughs> Quick to hear. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Okay? When we do the exact inductive Bible study method, okay, we should always have our ears open. Okay? Remember what I said about the first impressions? Okay? The Word of God just jumping out? Okay, that is God talking to you and you have to be sensitive to that that you would write it down and say okay Lord you want me to put more time in this word or in this phrase you want me to chew on this I'm going to do that okay? and you'll find that the Lord will fill you he will give you the desires of your heart then you would say after you've spent time doing that Chewing on it, right? Researching on it, putting time into it. Oh, the Lord will just bless you and what? What should your feeling be when the Lord blesses you? When you have a Bible study with the Lord Himself, just like the, the two men going to Emmaus. Their heart burned. Did our heart burn within us? That means that you have been fed by the Lord, that the Word of God has become useful to you, now you, are, you have a chance to mature, okay? you have a chance to be healed, you have a chance to become more healthy. Okay? And that is, in a nutshell, what inductive Bible study is. It goes through observation, interpretation, and application. It is a step-by-step -step process. It is a systematized study, orderly, okay, on how to study the Word of God. And guess who is the teacher? Yeah, the Holy Spirit. So when we study the Word of God, first and foremost, what do we have to do? Before we even open our Bible, pray, Lord, I need your help on this. Okay, you know what's in store for me? What are your plans for me? See? Fill this vessel. Fill me, Lord, so that I can be useful for who? For other people, so that other people will be led to the Father. See? Paul, again, this is one of the... I call it... Uh, Revelation that the Lord gave to me when I was reading in Second Corinthians still. He says uh, about a new creature. What is that? How was that? If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. What does that mean? All things that pass away. All things become new. Good. What is a, a good place to meditate on there? Ah, to be in Christ. What does that mean to be in Christ? Okay. Because if you are not in Christ, then the rest doesn't mean anything, right? But the first and foremost is that make sure that you are in Christ. Now, but then, how can we be in Christ? See? That's one thing that you have to spend time with the Lord. Lord, your word says that 
after being Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? Then you would go to the observation, interpretation, and the application part. Study it. What, uh, what does it mean to be in Christ? And there are other scriptures that will help you understand that. See? Then you will become a new creature. Uh, so uh, another question that we will ask ourselves is, uh, are we a new creature? Are you a new creature? Yes. Compared to when? Well, okay, very good. See? <laughs> True! That's the way it's supposed to be. We cannot be stagnant in our walk with God. See? You're coming here. Hopefully the Lord has made you a different creature in terms of your approach to the Word of God. See? He has given us this method. See? Hopefully the Lord has used me to be able to explain it clearly to you that you, now you can go and do it so that you will be constantly be coming more perfect, more holy, more righteous. So that this will be fulfilled. See? So that you will be equipped to do the good work that God has in store for you. If we don't start, spend time in the Word of God, can God use us? See? If we didn't listen to what God says, see, those first impressions, how can the Lord use us? You want to, there are also another inductive question is what I call it. Do you want to be used by the Lord? Mm. So therefore, if you want to be used by the Lord, what do you need to do? Make sure that you are what? Okay, uh, profitable, <laughs> but then again. Very good. That you are thoroughly equipped. What do you need to so that you'll be a, a, the best Bass guitarist that you could uh, be. <laughs> yeah, you need. <laughs> so you need to be equipped, right? <laughs> Likewise, the same thing in our ministry of the Word of God. Okay, we need to be equipped, and the Lord is more than willing to equip us. He has given us His Word. Now he has given us a way to how to study his word so that, yeah, we can achieve, that we can be a vessel that God can use for his honor and for his glory. Any questions with all of these? So, I pray that the Lord and you, that you will both have a feast. Enjoy a feast with the Lord when you sit down and give time to Him and try and use this method. Okay? There are some sheets that, God, that I've given to you that are part of the handout. Okay? That when you're studying the Word of God inductively, then you should have papers like this which is, what are you supposed to write down when you're observing? Who is involved? What has happened? Why, when did this occur? Where are they now? What was said? Okay. And then in the interpretation part, it says, I can separate these two pages. Ah. Interpretation. What did the, why did the author write this? What did the author mean? What did this mean to those who heard it? Okay. And then in the application, it talks about, there, is there an example that I should follow? Is there a sin that I should forsake? Is there an error I should avoid? Is there a promise I should believe? Is there a command I should obey? How will I go about making these changes? What specific actions will I take? Will I now take? Okay. So, 
When you have your uh, uh, time, study time with the Lord, try and use only the Bible and writing material. Okay? Follow the steps, observation, interpretation, and application, and the Lord should be able to do the rest. He will be able to teach you. He's the best teacher you can have. Okay? If you have been taught today, be thankful to God. Okay? Thank God that He gave you the desire just to be here. Okay? And the, the, thank God that I thank God that the Lord has used me again to try and make this profitable for you. And I pray that the Lord will continue to bless you, that you will bless others. Can you imagine how many people will be blessed if you could learn this? That's why I keep doing this whenever we go to the Philippines for our missionary trip. That if one person could learn this method, imagine how many can that person bless. People will only be blessed when they can eat the word of God. Okay. That the word of God will become part of their lives and they will be what God wants them to be. Okay? Any questions? So, Greg, you want to close with a prayer? Father, we thank you for giving us this time to spend together to learn how to do your work, Lord, how to be better students of you and your word. Lord, we pray that uh, if we would just take this and that uh, you would work in us, uh, what you can only do to give us that opportunity to study and to share know the world that don't know you, Lord. So we just thank you for Pastor Joseph. We thank you for the insight that you've given him to this method. So we pray that you would uh, use this method any time that we open up your word. But first, we pray, Lord. Um, we pray that you would be our teacher. So Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, Pastor Joseph. We pray that it was to bless his work over there. It's your work. Work through him. Lord, I pray that that name would come to know you. Thank you for always for that. Bless this day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right.